Hey, VC, how's it going? Right, we're back in the Vinyl Community Pub. I'm John, 6 Inch Penis 319. Once again, I'm joined by my mate Headley, another fat bearded man talking about records. Hey, oh, now so then, hello. By everybody's favourite madam, Madison. How, are How you doing, Paul? So excited. Hello, ladies. Lovely <laughs> to see you. Smoshing. Brilliant. Right. Okay. Well, we, we've been saying for ages, man, Heddy, that we've got to get you on because we always talk about 45s. We talk about seven inch singles. Exactly. And, you, and you're the man for, you know, for 45s. That's, that's you what know. jukeboxes oh. are, aren't they, John? Absolutely. You know. Absolutely. So, I mean, you've got, I think you've got a collection like nobody else, Paul. Well, the, th the thing is, John, I have always collected 45s right from 1972. You, you know, my first one, which was Burning Love. And I just never stopped. That was it. And when when people in, I, I don't know when it was in the 90s, but when people jettisoned their vinyl collection for CDs, mm. uh, you, you know, for me, it was just that I had literally people bringing in boxes of 45s. They'd, they, they'd had since they were a child, mm. just held no sentimental memories for them or anything like that. And we're just literally getting rid of so much stuff. And it was just... It, it was a heavenly time to be collecting all that kind of stuff, I must say. But but I'd never stopped since I was a kid, you know. It's funny that what you say there about people not having any sentimental attachment to to forty fives. Yeah. Because, you know when you know when we were kids, that's what we started off buying, wasn't it? You know, we all started off that's buying what we could record, kind of buy albums. So yeah. you know, that's where the romance is, isn't it? That's where you know. Yeah. Also, I don't know if it was like around your way, but they used to have ex jukebox singles, and they used to sell them in all kinds of weird places. Yeah. I mean, I remember the electrician stroke, like lumber <laughs> yard type place, had, had a box <laughs> on the counter. Yeah, and they were like, like they were like three for fifty p or something. Yeah. I can't remember yeah. what it was, but they were ex basically hit singles. So sometimes you used to get really good ones. I'm mean, in amongst the Piketty Witch. And you know, <laughs> like, you oh, just, I was gonna, I was gonna choose yeah, Piccadilly Witch. You, you, you could happily find something like, like a um David Bowie yeah. because it, they just overstocked on it. Yeah, you yeah. know, so it was, it was interesting. You, you, you know, you could find them everywhere. Excellent. But that, but that's the thing, isn't it? I mean, I've, I've never stuck to one type of music. Mm. I mean, I was a rock and roll fan right from the get go because I, because literally the first record I bought was Elvis. And so that the next step after that was Bill Haley, and I thought this this I love the beat on it, but this guy bloody I don't like his voice at all. Do you know what I mean? And he looks about fifty on the record sleeve. Yeah, yeah. And then when I saw a photo of him, I thought, oh my, Leo, this is a drop down, <laughs> isn't it? Yeah, he, he, even at sort of nine ten, I thought, oh dear, no, I feel a bit. Stupid here. So uh, and then yeah, the rock and roll chat, grooming, yeah. I think that's what it was. And then the next chat was Buddy Holly. And yeah. I just uh, believe that he'd written all these songs like at such an early age, and it really resonated with me, Buddy Holly. Do you know what I mean? And so I thought, oh, I'm definitely on the right path here. And the next one was like Little Richard. So it was yeah. just that was the epiphany, and mm -hmm. you know, I got my way. But it always kept my eyes and ears open for anything, really. I mean, I can remember when Craftwork came out with, with Autobahn, and they did that 45 of Autobahn, which is obviously yeah. like a shortened version. And I thought, I remember thinking, wow. That's that is really different. So that's the I mean? thing with with Kraftwerk Autobahn is um we all we, I'm sure we've all bought one of the old top to pop LPs in the past. The one that's worth getting is the one with Autobahn on it. Wow, I've never seen that, John. That sounds actually brilliant. I just, it? I just love the idea of these guys, you know, these session musicians going into uh, a studio yeah. for a couple of hours, and today you've got really this one. Well, you know? Yeah, I bet it sounds good, man. Yes, yeah, it's, 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 it's a real novelty. <laughs> You didn't have Pan's people dancing to it on top of the pops, did you? Probably. Probably didn't, <laughs> you know, so. No, but I anyway, so before, yeah. we might as well kick off. So what's yeah. everybody drinking? What you got there, Paul? I'm drinking, of course, like a madam of a brothel should be, a <laughs> pink colada, of course. Of course. Chin oh, chins, you lovely ladies. And what about yourself, <laughs> Italy? Uh It's called a fruity golden beer. I love something that's a bit fruity. Oh, Excellent. fruity. There you go. Fruity. Who were uh, misses? And I'm on yeah. the lager. Madrid. Of course. There you go. <laughs> right. So that's that out of the way. So, all right. And we might as well pick a tune. So, Paul, you know, so you know the deal. You've got a quid in your pocket. It yes. buys you a couple of plays on the jukebox. So what's your first tune? 
Well, I, I brought along a tune um, that, that I had Headley in mind. And I've, ah. got, I've, got, I've got John in mind and Headley in mind. So the Headley in mind tune <laughs> is LSD by, by Wendell Austin. Oh, right. And it, it is, in fact, LSD made a wreck of me and I won't be coming back. And it's Wendell Austin and the country swings and it's really out there country. I mean, it's, I don't know what sort of country you'd call it, but it is, it's very out there. I was just saying, when's that from? What's, what sort of period is that 1968, from? 1968, John. Right. 1968. So and things are a bit psychedelic. And so has that washed yeah, out the, to the country scene, yeah? The funny thing is, is that it's about a prison. They mentioned a prison that's up in Boston. And John, bit bop boom, actually knew the prison that, that he'd been singing about in it. Because he says... I took some knives and I killed my wives. I said, I'll find the night. You know, all that kind of stuff. You know what I mean? It's a DLSD war off from me. I didn't know what I'd done. You know, I thought you were going to say that he did time there. Well, <laughs> do you you know might what? have done. He, That's another story. John actually spoke to someone who actually said they remember it being played in a bar. It was on a bar jukebox. Wow. Actual record. And so it just, I thought, well, that's perfect then, isn't it? Oh, perfect. thank you very much. Well, I'm yeah. quite happy with that. So that's one for Headley, and that's a little story behind it. I was married once to Betty Lou And twice to Carol Sue Those doggone women nearly drove me mad I got hallucination blues I started using LSD, it gave me a quite a kick Better than booze and easy to use, but it made me mentally sick I'm on my way to awful prison, got the monkey off my back I'm on my way to awful prison and I won't be coming back I took some knives and I killed my wives, I took off in the night the LSD were offering me I didn't know what I'd done Until in court my case was heard The sentence I got was life Well, seeing as, as Madam Sin has, has uh, uh, chosen some bespoke tunes for us I thought I would <laughs> equally also uh, choose some stuff from my collection that, that might be more up, up uh, Madam Sin's street So I'm going to go for the first one I'm going to go with, hang on, I'll do it this way. So this is uh, Cherry Pie by Skip and Flip, which is, yeah, is a bit is. cheesy. It's a bit cheesy. I mean, it was, what was it? Was it Marvin and Johnny had the hit in the 50s? Yeah, Marvin it? and Johnny, Headley. Yeah, sort of, sort of doo-wop R&B kind of thing. Yeah. And, and Skip and Flip, the re I mean, one of the reasons I got this, apart from it being a kind of a, an interesting record, and I love the, the Brent labels. Nice yeah, I do. Design. Um, Skip and Flip are Skip Batten, who would later join the uh, the Birds, uh, the New Riders of the Purple Sage, and then finally the Flying Burrito Brothers in one of their yeah. later incarnations. He's right in and the heart of all that, isn't he? That's right. And and um, and Flip is a guy called uh, Gary S. Paxman, who yeah. is a very interesting guy. Probably, you know, after this, he went on and produced uh, Monster Mash. That's that was right. one of his productions. He did um, a lot of surf, early surf records and 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 mashing and doing the wild. Yeah, he was he was a real he was kind of ahead of his time actually when he was and he set up in Bakersfield. Yeah. He saw that the Bakersfield sound was doing quite well, and so he yeah. he he had a um, a mobile um, recording studio in the back of a of a of a of a coach or a bus, um, which he'd have people come into and um, and yeah. yeah, and so his. His label would 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 um, end up. Uh, he he had people like Clarence White um, and Gib Gilbo yeah. and various other people, yeah. uh, all all recording sessions with him. Um, it was a fabulous he time. In fact, died early on before they joined the Birds and and Grand right. Parsons band and all that, didn't he? Really? Yeah, that's right. That's right. And and, and if you listen to this, he he recorded albums under various names as well. Uh, uh, Rusty Dean. I've got a couple of Rusty Dean albums and singles oh. that he did, where he would just go into the studio with these guys, and then he'd sell the records, sell the uh, 
the rights to various small labels and they just put it out and he'd give him a little bit of cash to do what he wanted to do kind of more artistic stuff but um yeah and he he ended up network didn't you you know a little all these independent labels you know, oh yeah stuff. i'm I mean, fascinated by all those independent labels that were going yeah. it seems to be very much a thing not quite here we didn't have that sort of no, that it was, there wasn't thing. A range of them but i think it's just like the radio in 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 the states where it's such a big country you know everything is gets a bit more localized yeah um yeah. and um yeah so he he eventually ended up um uh, finding god and going a bit uh, and producing very weird albums like this one which is just oh my lord <laughs> yeah it's a crazy sort of gospel oh, album. that's pretty impressive that is Henry. so hold up that that al album cover again oh the album cover where have i put it hold up the album cover. It? go on i think that's worthy of proust that story <laughs> <laughs> it is. Um... Uh, no <clears throat> excuse me if i grew a beard that's what I'd look like because I can't <laughs> have a star. I can't <laughs> have a star show. I would have a full on, you know, Amos like that, you know. So that means Hallelujah, Hallelujah. Yeah, there you go. So that's that's something for me to focus on next week, isn't it? So. <laughs> <laughs> So I was, I was saying to Paul earlier on, I was down in London a couple of weeks ago, down in his neck of the woods. And I went to a, I went to a gig and I went to a pub afterwards, just off Brick Lane. I got chatting to a guy at the bar and this guy told me a story. And obviously, if a bloke in the pub told you a story, it's bound to be true, isn't it? Right. And we were talking about, I think something came on in Music Cameron in the pub, on the jukebox, whatever, it was a song by the Kinks. And he was telling me that Ray Davis still drinks in some of the, the, the North London pubs, the same yeah. pubs, you know, it's, it's, you know, still sitting in the same boozers. Mm -hmm. And apparently what once he goes into one of these one of these pubs and there's a guy at the bar he gets chatting to and, and he, he says to Ray Davis, he says, uh, so, so what do you do then? Right? And obviously didn't know who he was. And Ray Davis says, well, I used to be a rock star. And this yeah. guy goes, aye, aye, look who we got here. Old Mick Jagger, you know. <laughs> every time he goes in, every time he goes in the pub, everyone calls him Mick. Now I just <laughs> love the idea that everybody in the pub, that all the locals, know Ray Davis as Mick. Well, you know, know, it's got to be true because the bloke in the pub told me it, you know. So, Mick, I tell you what, Ray looks all right actually, doesn't he? Does, he? Yeah. He doesn't sound too bad either, actually. You know, I've seen him. You know, but, that's but, years. but look at look, Mick is eighty. I mm. mean, God, I hope if I look like that at eighty. As yeah. good as Mick Jagger looks. I mean, he looks amazing, doesn't he? <laughs> he does. What, what kind of What's a pack it? with the devil has he done? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, he, he does look extraordinarily fit, doesn't he, Mick? He, are they touring at the moment? They, 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 they always seem to be touring, don't they? So. But yeah, anyway, yeah. There is a very tenuous link to my next tune. So, <laughs> right, so we've got on stacks here, right? So this is... So this is sort of a link to the Stones. It's not the Stones, but it is I Can't Get No Satisfaction by Otis Redding. Yeah. So, oh, yeah. For me, the greatest soul singer of all time. It doesn't get any better than Otis. And, and this tune, I think, just highlights just how good he was. It's, he provides the momentum to the song, you know. It's it's just full of energy. You know, you also, there are brilliant him. live clips of him doing that, John, aren't yeah. there? I mean, Absolutely. really good live clips of him doing them, you know. Where he's really totally going hell for leather. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, you can't believe it. Was he only twenty six or something when he died? You know, well, just I mean, absolutely he heartbreaking. Like but he's such an older, mature man, doesn't he? Mm, he does. He's only in he his does. early twenties. He looks like a guy who's already got three or four kids. 
And Go on. I, I think you did have three or four kids. kids. Probably did. <laughs> well, yeah, he put you know, yeah, we that's yeah. just it, isn't it? You know, but he yeah. looks like a he's a very mature looking guy, isn't he? Very early on. But also, you know, maturity in his voice as well, you know, it's such yeah. power. You know, as yeah. I say, and he and he brings all that to this tune. I think this is ten times better than the original. That whenever I think about, um, whenever I hear Otis, there was, a, there was a documentary about Southern Soul, I think on Channel 4, probably mm. 15, 20 years ago. And it showed you Otis's body being pulled out of the, out of the yeah. water. Yeah. And I've got to say, I really wish I hadn't seen that. Mm. And I don't know, you know, it's an interesting documentary. It's an interesting, obviously. Well, Very it's gruesome, isn't it, John? Yeah, it's gruesome. Absolutely gruesome. You know, that's I I, I've it. seen it the once and I remember it, it did chill me at the yeah. time. I saw it. I thought, wow, yeah, that we don't need to see that. But there you go. But this version, you know, it's and I'll play a clip of this in a minute. It's absolutely fantastic. And this yeah, is one that's in my jukebox version, the home, so. where he's he's doing it on something like Ready Steady Go, I think it is. Yeah. And he's doing his back his feet are going behind him as he's he's sort of really getting into it. He looks like he's sort of like a chicken, you know, yeah, that's so right. The back feet, you know, and it's just fantastic. He's going hell for leather. The band are all riffing behind him, yeah. you know. It's just, it's just wonderful, isn't it? Imagine, imagine being some like English kid, right? And, and that Stax tour comes over, yeah. you, you, you know, and it's the Marques, isn't it? And all people like that, Eddie like, Floyd, yeah, and, brilliant. Yeah, and it, it must have blown your mind. Well, I think as well, I mean, it's clear, let's see in the footage now, just how much they loved being in the UK or being in Europe. More to the point, they being they Europe. were adored, weren't they? Let's face it. They, they, they were adored. They were, but also in the American South at that point, you still had segregation. So, you know, they they left Europe, went home and, and went back to segregation, yeah. you know. So, and over here, they were treated like kings, you know. So, but, um, but you talk about the to, rugby... they met oh. Chitlin Circuit as well, didn't they, John? You know, that's which... right. Yeah. We, we, we're talking we, about ready steady go oh. there's that i was talking about it previous um recently in a, in a video where you've got that great clip with otis on stage with chris farlow and eric burden nice. and, and to be fair the, t the two white guys are hold their own you know you'd think that the, the otis oh, would blow them good. away but it's a great clip because they were i don't know who it was because it wasn't jack good was it ready steady go i can't remember who it was but they were smart enough to get two guys that really could sing yeah, because let's face it, a lot of those '60s guys they couldn't sing, but yeah. both Eric and Chris Farley could really properly sing. Do you know what I mean? It wasn't just that they could sing in that black style. I mean, they really had strong, yeah, powerful voices, didn't they? And if you were yeah. going to be singing with Otis Redding, you you know, and you sounded like Mick Jagger, I mean, you you, you do, do you know what I mean? You, You'd be laughed off the stage. You wouldn't be. Like, You'd be well, they've got balls to get up there, haven't they? Yeah, <laughs> I mean, that's... Yeah, to be honest. You, 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 you know, I mean, it's a bit like, um, I suppose it's a bit like shaky getting up with Elvis, isn't it? <laughs> and that's that's cruel, that's a terrible comparison, uh, yeah. like, you know, it's not like that, but you know what I mean? You, you've got to have some balls, haven't you? So, Paul, tell us, have you got any shaky red kills back there? <laughs> you know, what, I'll tell you, I've got a shaky story actually Go on now. Then. Back in the day, of course, before people knew who he was, before he was the the, the best-selling artist of the 80s. Mm. Let us no, not... was he? No. Yeah. Over here. Let us not, Over here. Let us not forget, ladies and Green. gentlemen. Yeah, because he never cracked America. No. Well, they had Elvis. Well, exactly. <laughs> you know what I mean? It was pointless, wasn't it, you know, for them. But he, back in the day, when it was him and the Sunsets, they were one of the rock and roll groups that used to do the, the college university circuit, which was very lucrative back in the day. Don't forget, they started in 69 and they got their big start with the Stones, put them on a support on their 69 tour. And, you, you know, they were doing rockabilly at a time when re really most people didn't know what it was. Mm -hmm. you, you know, there were, there were two groups. Both of them came from Wales. One was Shaky and the Sunsets and the other was Crazy Cabin and the Rhythm Rockers. <laughs> And they both did these obscure rockabilly records that, that no one knew. The London groups used to come on and they used to go, good golly, Miss Molly, sure like the ball. You know, and you think, I don't want this nonsense. I've got little Richard at home. What yeah. do I need this stuff for? Yeah. Every, every record I heard from the Welsh groups, it was something I didn't know. Yeah. So they, they were very exciting. 
Yeah. That's what I think actually, I was thinking about this earlier on about Shaky because you know we're talking about our uh, sort of first records and such like. One of the first records that, that I owned was was Shaky and the Sunsets doing Jungle Rock. Yes. Which, and I think that's probably the seventh. Yeah. yeah, they yeah, did. I think, I think that's probably the first time I heard that song. I didn't hear the original. That's the first version no. I heard. You know. But they they were doing it at the time when it was re released, you, you know, in the charts, and he had that suddenly that freak hit with it. Yeah, and um, he, he, you know, they they used to do things like that. That that was what was so great. And then they used to do things like Don and Dewey. They used to do Justine, you know. So they used to do like the black ones and the rockabilly ones. They had a black piano player, right? Just to stand on his head and play, you know, like that and. Honestly, it was fantastic. It's, so it's... were they? So so Paul, were they? Were they pre? Because of course, we we later then had that um, sort of rockabilly revival, didn't we? Yeah, were they they were, were they? They were kind of before that, were they? They were. They, they, these two Welsh groups, Crazy Cavern and and Shaky, they were both mm. managed by the same guy, a guy called Paul Crazy Legs Barrett, <laughs> who was a fully paid up member of the Communist Party, and as a result. <laughs> Shaky used to play Communist Party Youth. <laughs> Communist Party Rock and Roll. And, and 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 you know what? When I when I worked in Kensington Market as a teenager, I actually met people whose dads were miners and had taken them along to do's and Shaky had played at them. Because <laughs> wow. it was some communist thing for the miners. So you you know, you people don't believe you when you say that, but you can Paul Barrett, he was the guy. Used to have a picture of Stalin on his. Of his oh, oh, really, yeah, really, for really the worst sort of commie, as we say <laughs> in the not fond of commie world. <laughs> Blimey! Just yeah, so the cool. more I hear about him, the less I like him. Yeah. Work in a record shop, then you. So, when, was it Rock On that you worked in? I did, John. I did my. I did my time originally in a place called Sounds at Swing. Yeah, which is which is just around the corner in in Venice Street, around the corner from Rock On, mm. doing originally the markets with a guy called Alan Jones that had been a journalist for the New Musical uh, for yeah. the. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Back, but yeah. back in the sixties. Back in the day when he said he used to hate it, he said, this is what made him give up, right? What, what happened was, this is how he got started in selling records. He had all the promo 45s. Okay. So all through the 60s, he was sending all these these 45s. Can you imagine, John, right? And he just had boxes and boxes of them and just put them aside. And he said, what, what, what made him give up was he had to go to the roundhouse and interview Jim Morrison. And they had these... List of questions like, what's your favourite colour? <laughs> what's your favourite meal? And all this. And he said, he, he got up there against Jim Morrison. Jim Morrison was probably tripping or whatever he was. You know, he's off his face. He looked at these questions he had sort of thing and he just said, oh, fuck this. And he started talking to him about history and politics, which is what he, he, he then went on and did a degree in. That's what he was interested in, basically. Yeah. We just started talking to Jim about that, and and they got, of course, had a really good conversation. He had nothing for an article, and then he, <laughs> he, he came back, back and jacked it in. And, and because he had all these boxes of records, he started a market stall. Mm. That's how I got working for him. He so, had like all, all the old gear on on promos. 
so, so so is that what so so did you have this taste in music before you started working there or was it working there that got the, no, the, it's the, I had that taste in it that I got the job John yeah it's a very odd child very odd child you you you, you, you know you know boys are into football or, or or they're into um sort of soldiers and all that kind of thing I was obsessed with records hmm. like obsessed pro proper yeah. Yeah. Mental, you, you you know, and and of course you could find them in lots of secondhand places as a child. Yeah. So that that's basically I, I used to just spend my whole time looking for records, you yeah. know. And those days there were lots of secondhand ones. That's how I built up a very big knowledge. And then they knew people knew they would say, "Oh God, if you met Paul, he's, he's like a record nut." That's how I got the job with Alan. Right. Then from there I went into rock on because Ted Carroll. He'd been, I'd been recommended to Ted Carroll and Ted Carroll and Roger Armstrong had Chiswick records above the shop. So that's where all those things, you know, there's one of these guys on, on, on the VC who collects Chiswick, isn't there? I can't remember his, which one it is. It might be Chris from Final Orchard. One of the guys collects Chiswick, but it was all those bands. Riff Raff was, was um, Johnny Bragg, uh, Billy Bragg. Billy Bragg, yeah. The Drug Addicts was... Um, the lovely lady um, who, who's dead now, um, Kirsty. Yeah. We, we used to sing with the Pogues. Yeah. You, you know, it was all people like that. The first Motorhead album, or all those yeah. kind of people. When I first used to see Lemmy, I didn't know he was in a group. I thought he was just a biker. I thought he was just <laughs> one of the bikers that used to hang around because you see him all the time. Do you know what I mean? So it was all kind of a, a bit of a revelation to me. But Rock On, yeah, I met everyone in Rock On. I mean, Bob Dylan came in there. It was that kind of place, do you know what I mean? But I got a proper education, because don't forget, this is pre-internet. Yeah, so, absolutely. So you could learn this, the only way you could learn this stuff was from these older guys. Yeah. And because and I was just obsessed, they used to sort of give me the time of day. Now, some people were condescending, but, but most people, older guys, were very good, actually, I thought. You know what I mean? They give you the sort of time of day, tell you stories point you in the right direction you like this or you like that then you, you know that kind of thing but do you not do you not think that's record shops in general paul i mean i, I love record shops i mean i know that you now we all talk about records and we talk about music but for me half of collecting is where you get the records from you know so it's you know i love those old school we talked about this before but i love these old school record shops where you can go in and you don't know what you're going to find and you're talking yeah. to an old boy at the counter or whoever, and, and just by having that conversation, you learn something, you know? Yeah. You learn something, you walk out there knowing something that you didn't know before you went in there, and I love that. Every time I, every time I talked to one of these guys, I would learn something. Yeah. So, you, you know, that was the thing. It was always a learning experience for me, and I was just like a sponge because, mm. you know, these guys would have all these stories. They would impart all this stuff. Not only that, but they would give you leads, you see. Yeah, they, they knew what your tastes were, so they would suggest stuff, which then would send you down a rabbit mm. hole. Mm. You, you see, and that's what I needed, really. Because when I was 12, my uncle sat me down. He said, look, you like Chuck Berry and Bo Diddley. Well, here's Muddy Waters, here's Howlin' Wolf, and here's Sonny Boy Williamson. Right, And I sat down and said, oh, my Jesus, what? what is this stuff? Do you know what I mean? He said, right. Here's Slim Harpo and here's Lazy Lister. And I had this. This was in one night. And we ended up on Snoop's Eaglin. And uh, it was like a whole lesson in the blues. And that really sent me down a rabbit hole. So, Headley, have you ever had a yeah. night like that where somebody sat you down and said, <laughs> no, and just reeled off a list of people that you've got to listen to? Yeah, there was this guy called Tex in a big hat. Um, <laughs> and he sat me down in this saloon. And he, uh, no, 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 I've, I've, I've not, no. I mean, it's, that's just it's, incredible. I, I feel, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's amazing. I wish I did. It is, it but, is but yeah. But the thing is, yeah. the thing is, you now it's, 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 it's easy if you want to find out about music. It's so easy, you know, which is, which is all the more depressing that people don't go and look wider. Yeah. Because yeah. it's so easy to do that. You know, yeah. you can go and listen to stuff that nobody's listened to for years and years and years, you know, or, or even thought about, but you know, that, that, that period where, you know, th that you had to rely 
on that sort of passing on of information. Yeah, you know, it's it's oh. like a it's like an um a sort of a, a verbal history. It, it's that sort of <laughs> anthropology kind of thing of of yeah. passing on the stories to the next generation. There is, but you've also got the thing then, somebody tells you about a song or plays your song, you've then got to find it. I mean, it that's could right. take years to find it, you know, it's not oh, like- Oh, that's right. Want, I mean, know. there's still records I've never found yeah. from those days where people said, you must have this. I still haven't found it. Yeah. No, there's always going to be records like that. That's kind of half the fun, isn't it, Jeremy? It is. It is. You, you know, you're constantly on the, I mean, it's, it's, it's like, I mean, it's like women. Right, it's it's the it's the thrill of the change. Hang on, I need, no, I need a notebook. I need a notebook. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's true. It's the thrill of the chase. Yeah, it's often a lot better than the catch. You you you, you know, uh, and I was terrible. I was like that as a teenager. Yeah, you, you, you know, and I would get to. By the time it got to the getting the taxi, I was already bored. Not bored, but <laughs> I, the, the, the real thrill of it was over. Oh, we're talking about women now, not records. Okay. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. I mean, records is another thing. No, because I was obsessed with records. I mean, yeah. you know, and, I, and as a teenager, I used to do all kinds of illicit things, John. I can't discuss for legal reasons, but to, to, to get the money to get records, because I was really, it was like a habit. You know, it was like a heroin habit, but it was 45s. Yeah. You know, and I just had to have them. What can I say? You know. So, all right, and Paul, what's your next pick? Right now, my next pick is for you, John. Oh, I like this. see, I've been thinking music in mind. You see, I like this. Yeah, I've been with these picks, and I have my my favorite reggae band is the Upsetters. Okay, and yeah. I brought along Clint Eastwood. Oh, what a tune! Because they've just reissued the album, John. The oh, Clint right, okay. album. Yeah. You know, with the with Sitting Under the Tree, with the yeah. hat on, all that. Yeah. Fantastic album. Dave Barker on it and all yeah, that. Yeah. You know? So I picked Clint Eastwood by The Upsetters, yeah. my favourite reggae band. Also, a firm favourite of my son's. Oh, fantastic. Yeah, I mean, and also... So well, it's on the punch label as well, Paul. I mean, what a beautiful, what a beautiful label that is. Those Palmer subsidiaries. Yeah. You you yeah. cannot go wrong. I mean, it's I know it's the absolute apex of skinhead reggae, isn't it? You know, it is. Yeah. Uh, Palmer and it really is, you know. Um, but you can't go wrong in those ones. No, you can't. And and uh, that's part of the of the attraction of the of the fun in collecting reggae is the labels. Yeah, you know, just I, because that's a big part of it, isn't it? The record, the, the physical recording levels, and the the design, the aesthetic of the whole thing. You know, yeah, I I imagine it was the same in Birmingham as it was in London. Yeah. You couldn't grow up w without listening to, I mean, the things things like um, you know, Liquidator and uh, yeah. Dave and Ansel Collins, Double yeah. Barrel, all those sort of things. You you couldn't escape them. I oh, mean, yeah. they were everywhere. Yeah. Those tunes. They used to play them at football matches. I mean, you, you know, they really were everywhere. They they were ubiquitous in my youth. Yeah, I think there is. I think there is a, a football team. Yeah, that still that still opens with Liquidator. I think. Chelsea, Chelsea, it's Chelsea, and, and Wolves as well. Wolves, you, Wolves use it as well. You know, so but yeah, no, you, you're right. Yeah. And and so even now, I mean, it's it's very much the that sort of. I suppose the the more not necessarily mainstream, but the more popular tunes. You still hear them in pubs in in the city centre in Birmingham. You know yeah. the likes of you know Double Barrel, Monkey Spanner, yeah. and stuff like that. You'll still hear yeah. those tunes. Yeah, but they always had those on the jukebox. They used to have Wet Dream as well by Max yeah. Romeo, oh. which the BBC would never play. <laughs> but of course, every jukebox had it. Yeah, uh, absolutely. You know, and that's that's where we heard it. You, you, you know, for the first time, it is funny. You know, it's funny, isn't it? Actually, with with regards to the BBC, because there are some tunes that that went under the radar. So you know, um, "Walk on the Wild Side." I mean, now yeah. as that song came out, there's no way that that <laughs> lyric, the Giving Head lyric, would would remain in the, and be played on the on the BBC. But, but when you think of of what that was about, that record and the cast of characters, yeah. of course, all factory types like yeah. Joe Del Sandro and 
you know, yeah. and Charlie Darling and this whole whole cast of New York deviants, basically, <laughs> that, that, that Lou knew, of course, and, and, and hung out with all these ne'er-do-wells. <laughs> <laughs> and and the, the whole tawdry tale is, is, is absolutely a shocking one, isn't it? Do you know what I mean? Yeah. But, um, I, um, but maybe, maybe it was prescient because, you know, all the transgender thing that, that Lou was singing about, now it's commonplace, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely, yeah. No, great. No, that's a great pick. That is. So, the, so you mentioned there, obviously, Clint Eastwood upset us. So it's it's a former, it's a former punter in the Nirvana Community Pub that sent me a copy of that. It's Ben Costello that sent me a copy of that quite recently, actually. Oh, did so, he? so there you go. So there you go. So let's have a drink to Ben. So yeah, but great choice. Of this parish, yes. Great one. Yeah. Good, Good on him. Okay, for my second one, staying sort of in the same sort of vein for, for Paul. Um, at the weekend, last weekend, I think Sunday, uh, we lost Clarence Frogman Henry. Yeah, of course, yeah. Um, who, who of course, yeah. had the hit with uh, Ain't Got No Home. And then was it, I don't know how, don't know why I, I, love, why you, I love you, but I do. But I do, it was a huge hit. I mean, really yeah. was a big hit over here. Uh, and the other so, one was called. So yeah, so so he obviously during the eighties, um, he was trying to find different things and going, and he recorded an album uh, over here, uh, and he covered um, a uh, a Chaz and Dave song. Uh, he yeah. he did a version of uh, "Ain't No Pleasing You." Really, um, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's on one of his it's sort of an album from nineteen eighty two, I think. I don't actually have it, but what I do have, he was over here sort of touring and doing some and he came over and he appeared on Chaz and Dave's uh knees up program that was on Chan that was on ITV. It was like early evening, Saturday evening television. And he he came there to do a couple of tunes and they got him into the studio while he was while he was while he was over before he, he flew back to the States. And they got him to cover one of their songs, uh that old piano. Wow! And so wow. here's a here's a single of 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 him doing uh, Chaz and Dave's, and it's on the um, it's on their their Rockney label. Rockney, yeah, <laughs> and yeah. it's great. It's great. Yeah. He, he, it's you know, it's. I mean, obviously, Chaz and Dave were heavily influenced by. Look at John. What are you laughing about? Look at this, you. This is becoming the bloody Chaz and Dave show. This. <laughs> <laughs> Well, every week there's another no surprise. Dave you, you, yeah, but John, John, I am eventually going to run out. You know, that's that you just don't live are. for that moment. That's the thing I don't think you are. <laughs> <laughs> don't worry, I've got some more that I can do. Oh, don't right. worry, okay. we were in, got some in the bag. But yeah, um, so <laughs> so apparently when they were in the studio, um, they he tried to do it like Chaz and Dave did it, and it wasn't really working, and so they they kind of. Uh, Chaz Hodges said to him, so how would you do it? What 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 way would you do it? And so he kind of went, oh, and he got into a more sort of New Orleans style of piano playing. And they went, ah, oh, that's it, bang. And that's what they recorded. But apparently, um, uh, Georgie Fame was in the studio in the next door room, desperately trying to produce some sort of New Orleans style <laughs> blues uh -huh. and failing miserably. And he walks down the corridor and suddenly there's Clarence Frogman Henry playing it out of the and he's like, What the hell? <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, no, it's, I love it's that great. Style. It, it's really lovely. It's a really lovely version of their song. So 
Um, yeah, oh. so that. And, you know, well, fantastic. Well, there you go. And another another Chaz and Dave Lincoln. Uh, yeah, always, Lincoln. always. There you go. to me then right so so i'm going with the equals with black skin blue eyed oh, boys that's right. a great so, yeah so, yeah so i mean obviously eddie grant i mean growing up in in the 80s eddie grant you know you think about give me hope joanna and i don't want to dance and electric avenue but yeah. we had this whole life before Denny in the 60s yeah and I mean, the, the equals were, were quite unique, really, because certainly in Britain they're they're a, they're a mixed race band, you know, white and black yeah. guys together. Yeah. And this this is a, a proper full on UK soul funk tune, and it's a protest song as well, you know. I know. Black black skin blue eyed boys. Very open up know, wars, you know. Yeah, it's, it's it fantastic, big, you know. And it was a big skinhead tune. Yeah, of course. Yeah, of course it was. Yeah. So. But it's um, you know, it just shows that protest music doesn't need to be a bloke with an acoustic guitar. You know, no. it's it's a full on. It is a full on UK funk record. Absolutely it's, wonderful. I, I think Eddie Grant, Eddie Grant was he was obviously a clever guy, wasn't yeah. he? You know, he he had the the the, the eye and the ear for, for what people wanted and uh, those things. Like, I mean, I lived around the corner from Electric Avenue. Yeah, it's where all the fruit and veg was. Fixed them, um, and, and the fact that he could make a big hit out of something like that, yeah, you know, all, all credit to him, you know what I mean? Amazing, really. Those equals records, fantastic, they are, yeah. Stuff yeah. like Viva Bobby Joe and oh, brilliant tunes, yeah, they are. <laughs> and he was young, yeah, of course, he was. And and now he lives in Bar- Barbados and he bought the um, the island slave, <laughs> he bought the big slave owners, um. Plantation. Oh, really? Oh, really? oh wonderful. Yeah. So he's in the old slaver's house, the huge, the huge yeah. mansion with all the plantation. It, it, it's edited now. That's yeah. where he makes all his music. He's got a studio in there and everything. Yeah, so yeah. it's really great how it's turned out, isn't it? You know, it is. And and this this record as well, you, you can hear the influence. And obviously the, the specials covered yeah. this in, in in recent years. And you can you can see the the influence that the Eagles had on a band like the Special straight away, can't oh, you? Totally. I, yeah. I mean, they're just like the forerunner, aren't they? They are, yeah. You know, they really. And and when you look how about these to be with the mohair suits and all that, yeah, looking really sharp, all modded up. You know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. You, you see the whole the whole influence. Not, so not, is that a sort of mid seventies thing then? No, not no. nineteen seventy. Is that is their last hit? They, they had a string of right. hits in the late sixties, but this is right at the end of it. And I say mm. it moves away from that pop sound to more of a funk sound. It's a British funk sound. And yeah. uh it's it's interesting the fact that at this stage you can see the you can see the, the British music and getting their own sound together. And it's yeah, it's really interesting. Mm. The, cla- the clash really, covered the yeah. Eagles as well, didn't they? On Sandinista, Police on My Back. That's a, that's an Eagles tune. And I yeah. must admit, I, I I knew it was an Eagles tune fr- from the Sandinista version, but I'd never heard the uh the original by the equals until recently yeah. and you know it's, yeah fantastic absolutely wonderful yeah i think they're a great group for equals they were massive on the continent yeah. especially in germany where, where they were where they were just had hit after hit you know yeah but people sort of forget they've sort of not they haven't been written now they but when they go back to the 60s and look at you know to do these documentaries they tend to get a bit overlooked don't they they do yeah you, you know, I mean, what wasn't it? Wasn't it a number one baby comeback? Baby comeback was number one, yeah, absolutely yeah. It was, yeah. 
Yeah, massive tune. Yeah. And of course, it was a massive hit as well in the nineties. Again, when it was reissued, I mean, it's not a great version, but it just goes to show the the strength of the song. You know, the fact that you know, well, yeah, it still stands up, doesn't it? Do you know what I mean? Yeah, twenty five years. Was that, that Pato Banton? Who was yeah, it? Was, yeah, yeah, you was it, you've got to hand there paul we, we normally only have two tunes but go on what you got there well do you know i've got i think this might appeal to both of you might have this on your jukebox but this is a nice old sun 45 mm. to show you of um jack jacker or slow down oh fantastic and it's one of the first when when i first started getting to the sun records well, well it was elvis and then it was Carl Perkins and Jerry Lee. And then when I started getting into the Rockabilly guys, this was the first one where I thought, wow, this guy's really unhinged, you know. This is really a hint of... <laughs> this 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 might be someone who enjoys carnal relations with their sister while drinking a lot of moonshine. You, you, you know, <laughs> and, and, and probably nicking their mum's slimming pills as well. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. on top of it and then doing things at midnight that shouldn't be spoken about you know it, it it suggests all those kind of things it's so unhinged where he goes you you be the wheel and i'll be the spoke <laughs> just think wow <laughs> it's really out there isn't it do you know what i mean and 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 of course that really sent me down a rabbit hole because yeah. then I was looking, of course, for records like that by Jack Earls, you know. Yeah. But he was obviously a special one. And and did he make many more records? No, he didn't. Uh, unfortunately, only another great one. But there's another guy called Jimmy Wages. And he did a record called um, Madman and also Miss Pearl. And he is completely unhinged as well. He he sounds like he, he might be enjoying with carnal relations with some of his relations. <laughs> uh, and, uh, you know, definitely taking some illicit substances. But, um, no, the thing with Sun is, is they had those really sort of straight guys, didn't they, that were just trying to be Elvis, obviously. And then they had these really out there hillbilly guys that were just completely one of a kind, you know. But so how, how, did you, how did you hear that, Paul? So, so you know, was that one oh. from... Uh... Was that you know somebody, somebody passing on their knowledge to you, or was it? What was it? Do you know it was so strange, John? Because I can really remember the first time I heard the word rockabilly. Because you, you know, up until then, re re really, fifties Teddy Boy music, as it was, was just referred to as rock and roll. Mm -hmm. And and in and in seventy five, the 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 Elvis Sun collection came out, and they referred to these Sun records as rockabilly. Right. I thought oh, that's an interesting term. That that sounds like it might be fun. And then Phonogram, of all people, put out these three volumes of Sun Records, and it had all this stuff on. That was definitely on there. Slow down, and it had all those sort of things on it. Billy Lee Riley, and yeah. you know, mm. sources rock and roll. It was all the classic, all the ones that everyone knows now. But we're talking about 1975. <laughs>
Well, Billy, Billy Lee Riley was the first one when uh, Shelby Singleton bought the, uh, the 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 label, or at least the name. That yeah. um, he he went back, and Billy Lee Riley was the first one he recorded um, from the old the old days. You know, it, um, yeah. he was very talented, Billy Lee Riley. I mean, I saw him back in the day. I saw most of those guys, and he, he was one of those guys. He'd done blues stuff. He'd made garage records. I mean, he'd made soul records. I mean, so a... oh, didn't he? Billy Lee Riley. There's a oh, I can't remember what his name. He goes under a different name. There's a Stax country record because Stax yeah. did put out some country stuff, and there yeah. is a compilation of of their of their um. Yeah, those he, he, and he, he and he's, he's, a lot of different names. Yeah, yeah. Names. there's something. He does a brilliant version of Long Black Train, which is absolutely yeah. cracking. Absolutely cracking. Yeah. So what you're saying earlier on, boss, going back to you working in in Rock On, the yeah. first time I heard Billy Lee Riley was on a compilation that Ace Records put out, which was which was music from the Rock On Shop. Yeah. Um, so the stuff that was played in the Rock On Shop. So, you know, so so did Ace Records, was was that almost like a spin-off from the shop? It came from it because what what the story is, John, is that where 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 Rock On was, it was it's, it's number three Kentish Town Road. Mm. Now at number five was Holtz which is the first guy, Alan, bless his heart, he's passed on now. He was the first guy to bring Dr. Martins into the country. In 1958, he started importing them from Czechoslovakia. And of course, no bugger wanted them apart from workers. And then in 1969, suddenly every skinhead in the country wanted Dr. Martins. Alan was the man with them. So he, he basically became a Dr. Martin shop. And he was next door. He's a lovely guy. It's now his grandson who has the shop. So it's passed on. But when you see madness, yeah. you, you, you know, in, in Camden, with the doctor, that, that's where they are. They're at Alan's place. So that was next door. And, and next door to that, was the other side was a chippy. But upstairs was Chiswick Records. Then Ace Records came out of Chiswick Records. Right, okay. Chiswick Chiswick Records started, the very first release was a, was a reissue of Brand New Cadillac. Right, yeah. Vince Taylor. Yeah. Now, they, they got the rights to it because all these Teds wanted it. They, these Teds kept coming in. Have you got Brand New Cadillac? And they didn't, of course, because it was hard to get that red Parlophone single. So Ted thought, right, I'll reissue it. Got the rights from Parlophone. Put out 2,000 copies. They, they went within days. They did 75,000 on that, which was an incredible amount for reissue 45 back in 1975, I think it was. That's why the 101ers, yeah. who were on yeah. Chiswick, yeah. that's why Joe did a version of Brand New Cadillac, because yeah. that was literally, he was the, the uh, Keys to Your Heart w yeah. was probably about number four after, or whatever it was, just after Brand New Cadillac. Yeah. So that was the connection, because Joe used to come in the shop did he really? And out of all those people, I haven't got a lot of time for musicians because I've met too many of them and hung out with them for too long. But Joe, bless his heart, was a lovely guy, really nice guy. And he really knew his stuff. And of course, he was into rock and roll. And one of the things that we both liked was Professor Longhair because he loved that New Orleans piano stuff. Mm. So that, but he was a genuinely nice guy, unlike some I won't mention. And 
the girl I work with, Vicky, in the shop, who now has sadly passed on, her first boyfriend was Lee Brillo, you know, from Dr. Feelgood. And her second boyfriend was Rat Scabies. So <laughs> she used to bring all these people into the shop. So there was this whole network of people, e even just through Vicky, the people she knew, because she worked at Ireland as well. She knew Lucky Gordon that, that, that had been in the Christine Keeler thing, the perfumer scandal and all that kind of stuff. So there was this whole network of people. It was a very interesting bunch of people. Yeah. So how long were you there for, Paul? So, so... Um, from 85 to 96. Right. So 11 years. I started off as a Saturday boy. And I ended up being being half owner of it. Oh, really? So I, yeah, so I'd gone from for, for of a very short space of time, I'd gone from being a Saturday boy to the others either being junkies or or, or two and together to turn up on time. I was the only one who used to turn up on time, so I was made manager. Oh. I went from literally from being, being a Saturday boy to being manager. I jacked in with my other, all my other jobs I had. I, all, I had all sorts of things going on, John, you know. <laughs> and uh, I, 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 I jacked all that in. I went full time at Rock and I worked six days a week. And I did that for 11 years, man. Yeah. yeah. And I learned a lot. I did learn a lot. And, and I, 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 God, I met some characters. I mean, at one time, I was letting a heroin dealer come in his name was peter packet i used to call him pete the packet and he was supplying throb throb from primal scream uh, <laughs> jason from spiritualized and uh sonic boom from the, the spaceman something or three or something should, should, should we add allegedly <laughs> allegedly and they and and these and all these people were allegedly coming in and picking up um packages from Pete the packet allegedly. allegedly. So, yeah, it was all it was all allegedly going on, mate. Yeah. I tell you what. <laughs> I mean, I mean, the things that used to go on in there, fucking hell, man. I mean, honestly. So, so I, I, I yeah. see. I put up a video recently where I showed a a promo yeah. screen record, and and you in the comments mentioned about about Bobby yeah. SB uh, yeah. writing rocks or the lyric to rocks, oh. and you you were there, yeah. So go. On. Let me tell you, let me tell the story of that, John. Because they were around the corner in Chalk Farm Studios, which is just around the corner from Rock On. It's up by just Bath Compendium, and it's on the way to the Roundhouse. It's yeah, on the, okay. I know you are, yeah. side, It's on the safe side of the road, you know. So, oh, Marine Ices across the road. Yes, oh. exactly, with Marine Ices across the road. So so I went up there. I, I was going up there not to see Bobby, of course. I was going up to see Pete the Packet. And <laughs> with this other... Allegedly. Next, Sorry, well, carry on. Allegedly. And <laughs> so... As, as I was allegedly going to meet uh, Peter the allegedly packet, um, <laughs> but they, they they were waiting. They'd already recorded all the, all the tracks for that album, and they were waiting for for Bobby to come in with the lyrics. And and it happened to be at that time it was the lyrics for Rocks Off, so they they would literally record all the music it was all mixed and everything. And Bobby came in with the. Uh, you know, rockers rocking and boppers bopping and all that kind of stuff sort of thing. Because I was only in there because I was waiting for Pete, you know. But I was there at a moment of rock and roll history. Yeah. You know, I, I, only because I was just put after illicit substances that shall not be named, but you can guess at, obviously. Fantastic. <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah. Brilliant. So, Paul, he's been absolutely brilliant, mate. Fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, thank you so much. It's been cracking. Well, it, so well, it was allegedly good fun, John. <laughs> no, 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 no. I have had fun. It's not alleged. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, cool. Yeah. Right, so there you go. So that's that's another night down the pub with, I don't know, maybe seven or eight tunes tonight. And uh, that's, <laughs> that's me, Headley, yeah. Paul and Pete the Packet. You know, brilliant. Uh, <laughs> listen, I got, listen, I got stories, man. I mean, I got more stories than I can remember, John. Oh. Oh, you're going to be back, aren't you? Yeah, you, 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 you've got to come back, Paul. We'll do this again. Just mate. do one and we'll do the Nick Kent stories because Nick Kent used to come up once a week. And yeah, so, so actually, so just on that point, I was listening to an interview the other day with um, Neil Tennant out of the yes. out of Pleasure Boys. That's right. And he was basically saying about going to a punk gig in the late 70s, where obviously quite a famous in incident where 
Sid well, Vicious. Sid Vicious. Yeah, yeah, he obviously he whips, he whips um, yeah, yeah. Uh, Nick Kent yeah. with a bike chain. And, yeah. and Neil Tennant was about, I don't know, 20 or 30 yards away and, and witnessed it. And he stopped him going to gigs for two That's or three right. years, you know, because it was such a violent incident, you know. Yeah. Right. Well, the thing is, I I, I knew Sophie, who, who, was, who was Stan Brennan's wife. I don't know if you remember, I did a thing about Stan, uh, um, Shane from the Pogues. Yeah. About when yeah. Shane died. Stan Brennan was the first manager of the Pogues. His wife Sophie used to was McLaren's secretary. She used to pay the Sex Pistols their weekly wage, twenty five pounds a week. Back in nineteen seventy seven, right? So it shows you what sort of money they were on, right? Sort of myth, isn't it? Do you know what I mean? Yeah. But but Sid Vicious. We're only in it for the money. <laughs> yeah. Sid Vicious was was a was a was a weed basically, mm. and he was a cat torturer. He liked torturing cats. He was a really nasty piece of work. People will say, "Oh, lovely old Sid," right? But he he was really actually quite nasty. His mother was a registered heroin addict, and he'd grown up in this really sort of bohemian world. Sid, you know, he was he was another John. His real name was John, mm. you know. And it was quite sad, really, because when he finally got into heroin, it turned him from this weedy sort of guy that was quite, you know, just harmless, really, into this really nasty guy. And he, and he felt he had to prove it. And, and Nick Kent, a guy who's never had a fight in his life, um, he, he decided to, to start whacking him with a bike chain, of course, in front of everyone, mm. as this kind of thing, you, you know, look at me, I'm so hard. I, I'm picking on Nick, a guy who was literally had such a bad, not only did he have a heroin habit, at that time, he had a speed habit. He had a coke habit. You, you, you know, he he was smoking like sixty fags a day and and living off soup. You you, you know what junkies are like. He 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 was hundred and ten pounds wet. You know, and here's Sid whacking him with a bike chain. It was a very cowardly act. Everyone knew what it's about. He tried the same thing with Paul Weller. He didn't know that Paul Weller's dad had been a boxer mm. <laughs> and brought. Paul up in, in in the accustomed tradition as as is in Romford or wherever he came from, and he and Sid tried that with Paul, and, and Paul put him straight down in two punches, you know, but but he went around bragging about that Nick Kent thing. It was really sad, man. And Nick Nick is a great guy, and Nick, you know, he used to he used to come in the shop and when he still when he still had the habits and he used to have his his shirts all undone down here, and, and you know. You know, the thing with Nick was he was the, the the member of the Rolling Stones you didn't know about, and all his stories revolved around, you know, oh, well, we're making Keith for having a fist fight backstage, and all that kind of stuff, and Led Zeppelin. I was on the Led Zeppelin plane. I mean, honestly, <laughs> Spinal Tap fans, it's just <laughs> absolutely Nick is the absolute pinnacle. I've got a book somewhere. I'll dig it out. <laughs> That he that he gave to a mate of mine, and it says in it, "I hope you can write a book as good as this one day." <laughs> Nick, Nick Ken, it's fantastic. His ego is just enormous, but a, a lovely guy. Yeah, great guy. But but if you've got if you've got tales like that, then why not have the ego yeah. to go with it? You know, absolutely. Yeah, we'll do you know that that's just it, John? Uh, you know, and 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 at the end of the day, Nick Nick was actually a Beach Boys fan. And he finally got this chance to go and uh, interview Brian Wilson. And it was at the time when he had this Landy guy looking after him. He was sort of, you know, he was filtering everyone who came in and everything. And as soon as Landy went out the room, he came over to Nick and went, Danny Drugs? (laughs) 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 Allegedly. (laughs) Yeah, allegedly. Allegedly. Because obviously Nick was just a chronic junkie, allegedly. <laughs> you, do you know what I mean? And, and Brian was going up to the window and opening it and going, you see? Fresh air. Fresh air. You know, stuff like this. <laughs> you know, and then, and then pulling out things like carrots and going, these are good for you. You know, and all this kind of stuff. It was just, it was fantastic. And Nick, Nick just is just full of stories like that. That's he was me. brilliant, you know, brilliant on his own. I mean, you could have a whole Nick Kent in Camden <laughs> episode, bless his heart, you know. Brilliant. Right, OK. He had to go to France to get clean, John. That's one they could get clean. On that note, we're going to wrap it up. <laughs> <laughs> right then, guys. 
And thanks for another great night in the pub. Yeah. Plenty of tunes, plenty of stories. Just cool. another average night, John. Just an average night in the boozer, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> right, see you next time. Bye-bye. See you later, chaps. <laughs>